Hello and welcome to the Today's Homeowner Weekly Podcast. We're here to help you with the challenges we all face as homeowners. I'm Danny Lifford. And I'm Joe Truini. And each week, Danny and I are here on the podcast to answer any and all home improvement questions. And we want to hear from you. Send us your questions or comments at todayshomeowner.com slash podcast. Okay, Danny, let's get started. Today's Homeowner Podcast is brought to you by The Home Depot, How Doers Get More Done. This week, we help a homeowner that's considering insulating their garage. You know, a lot of people think about that because, you know, a garage, if it doesn't have a heat or cooling source, which most of them don't, then they can get really hot or, in this case, really, really cold. So there's several different ways to approach insulating an area that is not heated or cooled, and we share those ideas on this podcast as well. Yeah, if you have a garage and you have access to the ceiling above and the walls typically Mm -hmm. aren't insulated, yeah, you might as well insulate it and make it more usable. Um, We're also going to talk to a homeowner who wants to convert a carpeted staircase into hardwood. So can you do that? Yes, you absolutely can. Remove the carpeting, put on some nice hardwood, and we're going to share a couple of tips on how to do that. And I love this because uh, she is doing the research and and the background and everything for her husband. So they're working together on this, which is a a great way to go. I know my my wife, when we're doing a lot of things, she will research a lot of the options out there. Then we sit down and talk about it and decide on the right one. And then because she loves to order and uh, wear those FedEx guys out, bring us up, up to the front door. There. So, so. Also, we, um, uh, you know, this time of the year is when uh, people start looking at the outdoors, but when is it too cold to apply paint on the outside of your house? This is a great question and a great topic to talk about because you don't want to put in a lot of work and doing all of the prep work, applying a good quality paint only to have it fail a few weeks later if the temperature does not hold up where it needs to go. So we give some some good guidelines on what to do about that and also the right way to remove mold and mildew off the outside of your house. And I'm going to share a really handy, simple solution on how to quickly, easily, and safely cut plywood on a pair of sawhorses. All right, that's very important. That can be a dangerous little project if you don't do that right, or you end up cutting your sawhorses in half. That's uh, That can be embarrassing. A little yeah, bit. then they have one sawhorse and two little sawhorses. I know. (laughs) So, yeah, you multiply them, but that usually doesn't work out very well. Well, you can see we have a lot to cover, so we'll get started right now. Right now, we're going to head a little further north, maybe North Dakota, and check in with Tom. Tom, welcome to the show. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Absolutely. Yeah. Let us know what you have in mind here as far as your um, your garage. Well, what I'm I'm looking at doing, first of all, I have an unheated garage, and up here, the winters get pretty cold, but yet, uh, you know, right now, I, the the garage captures some heat, just just radiating from the house, you know. Uh-huh. And I I was just thinking about maybe insulating the uh, the garage, at least the uh, the ceiling, and maybe the north and west walls, mm-hmm. uh, just to try to pre- try to uh, retain some of that uh, some re- retain some of the heat. What I'm looking at doing uh, is either putting some fiberglass bats up there. Six-inch bats, you know, that fit down in with, within that uh, within the truss rafters. Sure. Or maybe just going with the spray foam insulation. Uh-huh. Uh, the question I really have on it is, if I go with the spray foam insulation, is that going to create problems as far as moisture retention? Well, I'll tell you, you're going to be dealing with a potential moisture retention regardless of how you insulate it. Uh, the the foam, I don't know if you've priced that, that's going to be really costly to to come in even though it's a very simple uh, type of application. It will cost you a fair amount of money to have that blown in. Now, if you do blow in that, that's generally blown on the um, underside of the roof decking, and then if you have any kind of um, gable uh, in, they would spray it and then right down on all of the walls that they can get to. So basically, you're just enclosing that whole entire envelope with the foam. Now, that probably is going to be your best way to go, though it's more expensive. Now, if you go another route that's less expensive and easy to do yourself is to use mineral wool insulation. Uh, one of the brand names there is Rock Wool, and um, that's that's pretty uh, friendly. And the reason I would recommend that is because it's very moisture resistant. It, it won't mold. It won't mildew. It just doesn't absorb the um, water and the humidity like fiberglass would. So um, that probably would be a better way to go. And it it will help. I mean, it will help retain whatever heat you have there. uh, But without a little bit of a heat source, you're still going to have, you know, a cold area in there. Sure. And and my garage right now, we've got the 5 8 inch sheetrock on the ceiling. 
So I guess what I was just looking at doing was just addressing the ceiling at this point. Um, the other thing I was thinking is uh, maybe with the cars going in and out uh, frequently, I probably wouldn't have much of a re- moisture retention issue anyway, but um, I don't plan to put any sort of a heating source in there. Okay. Okay. Well, it'll still it'll still help tremendously. Anything that you can do to insulate you from the outside is going to help a lot. So I would uh, maybe get a price on the spray foam, but then you know consider the mineral wool um, as another alternative. I did check out the spray foam. It runs about oh about two and a half times the cost of uh, fiberglass bat insulation. That I didn't, sounds right. I, mm-hmm. I didn't, and that's just basically looking at the my cost of just the and then I install it bats myself versus yeah. having somebody come in with a spray foam. Right, I got you. And and the mineral will be slightly more than the fiberglass, so it's it's in between those pricing that you have there. So uh but it's so easy to install and just I mean it, it's 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 a great way to go. Some you know sometimes some areas of the country it's hard to find it, but that is a something we'd certainly recommend. Sure. Does the mineral wool is that a safer product to handle than the fiberglass bats? Uh, actually, um, I know I don't even wear gloves with it. I mean, it, it, it doesn't irritate you at all. Um, and I mean, it might irritate somebody, you know, that, that, that is very sensitive to it, but, uh, we've, uh, we've used it without gloves. You take a, a serrated, uh, bread knife, um, like a cake knife, and you're able to cut it very, very easy, fit it around every little crook and cranny that you have there. So, um, I, I like it a lot. Okay. Well, thanks. I'll have to take a look at that too. Good. All right, Tom. Well, thanks so much for uh, being with us here on the show, and uh, best of luck to you on your project. Sure. Thank you much. We're going to go right to Missouri right now. Deanna is on the line with us. And, Deanna, I understand you're uh, doing a little research for your husband there on a project. Tell us all about it. Yes, I am. Well, um, we've lived in, our, lived in our home 25 years, and we're redoing each each level, each room, one by one. And now we're about done. And we have a two-story house, and it's got a stairway, so when you come in the front door, that's the first thing you see. Mm-hmm. And we and it's got carpet on it, so we want to remove the carpet um, and put the wood steps in like you see nowadays and put a, a runner down the middle. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so we want to redo our stairs to make it look nice, but a little nervous about how to do that. Okay. All right. Well, it is a uh, significant project. I mean, uh, uh, it's something that we've done many, many times. And of course, every staircase is built a little different. And so removing that carpet, uh, and also there will be a a little strip there on each of the stairs. It's a tack strip that you would have to remove. Mm -hmm. And you really have to get down to that part before you can measure and decide the the pieces of um, oak or hardwood that would go over that. Now, there are many companies companies that that sell the kits and customize it for years and, and, and it's kind of like putting together a puzzle but um uh, joe in there um have you seen it done a couple different ways when uh, deanna's mentioning putting the carpet down the middle right um have you seen them where they just put the ends on just that instead of covering the whole thing with oak they just do the end caps on it and then run the runner down the middle have you seen that very often yeah i have and deanna so we're talking about you don't, you don't have a runner going down you have like each tread is comp- and the risers, the vertical parts, are completely wrapped in carpeting. Is that correct? Is that what you have yes, now? Yes, that's yeah, that's how it is today. They're all wrapped. Mm-hmm. Okay, and have you pulled up the carpet to see what's underneath there? Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll hold on. Go get your husband and tell him. No. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, chances are you're going to find plywood and particle board or whatever they use, nothing that you want to keep. But, yeah, there, there are a couple of ways to do that. As Danny mentioned, sometimes you've seen hardwood, you may have seen hardwood um, treads with the runner down the middle, you know, mm-hmm. so underneath you wouldn't know what was there. Um, so right. you could do you could try that. Um, and the nice thing about that is when the runner wears out, you can easily replace it. Um, mm-hmm. And actually, there's a, a simple solution that if you have a runner that comes down your steps and it goes across the, the treads and then down the risers and the treads start to wear off, what you can do is disconnect it and, and pull it down like eight or ten inches. And what you end up with mm-hmm. is with the clean surface that were on the risers are now on the treads. Mm-hmm. Right. So you're basically, mm-hmm. you know, get a whole new carpeted surface. But yeah, there are a couple of different ways to go. There's a there's a company, Danny. What's the name of the company? L J Smith, and Smith. you can reach them yeah. at um, ljsmith.com. And uh, and they've got a pretty good group of people that you can really call, send pictures, send measurements, and they can design the entire thing for you. That 
that might be worthwhile so that you can get mm-hmm. an idea on the cost of it um, sure. and to be able to see uh, if it is something that you want to tackle. I mean, it's, a, it's not that hard. But it's just a little complicated in in ordering mm-hmm. the right pieces, but they can they can help um guide you through that part of it, and then it's to, time to break out the glue gun, and uh, mm-hmm. it'd be really nice to have a pneumatic nailer with the right nail nails to uh, be able to recess the nails and make it really go together very well. But definitely plenty of construction adhesive. Okay, great. Dan, is your husband pretty handy? He is. Good. He's very handy. We've re- redone the um, living room, uh, kitchen, bedroom, um, bathroom, and he's pretty much done it all himself. Great. So, yeah. Well, the good thing about this project is that you know you can get better as you go along, right? Because you're basically redoing yeah. the same thing for each step. Um, mm-hmm. And so, I'm sure after doing two or three treads, he'll probably get the hang of it, and I'm sure it'll come out great. Mm-hmm. Um, and often, you only have to replace the risers. The, excuse me, the treads. The risers are usually pine or something, and those are fine. If it's plywood, you don't like it, I would, I would sand them, prime them, and paint them, and leave them, mm-hmm. and then just put the hardwood oak, as yeah. Danny mentioned. Oak, red oak is typically what they use. Yeah, I think that's what we're going to go with is oak, for sure. It'll match our hardwood floor. So Great. Well, good luck. Excellent. Well, well, that's a great project, and you're very smart to do a little research here ahead of time. But uh, there's a lot of companies out there, but this is one that we know uh, that we've worked with before. So, uh, ljsmith.com. Okay. Got it. And I will look them up. And thank you, Danny and Joe, for your um, help and your information. Hey, our pleasure. Let us know if we can help you any other time. You have a great weekend. Okay. You too. Tell you what, right now, let me share with you our best new product of the week brought to you by The Home Depot where doers get more done. Managing your thermostat well is an important part of making your home more energy efficient. And the all-new Ecobee Smart Thermostat with voice control makes that job even easier than before. In addition to the Wi-Fi connectivity that you would expect from a smart thermostat, this model also has voice control by Alexa built right in, and it integrates well with other systems like Google Assistant, as well as Apple HomeKit and Samsung SmartThings. It also includes a smart sensor to keep important rooms comfortable by adjusting your thermostat based on occupancy and the, and the temperature. So you can control your thermostat at home or remotely using your voice, phone, computer, or Apple Watch. Wow, look what the world's coming to. <laughs> <laughs> and that control can translate into energy savings of up to 23% on your energy or cooling cost. Wow. Compared to holding that thermostat at 72 degrees all the time. So to find out more about the Ecobee Smart Thermostat with voice control, go to homedepot.com. They always have some great, great products that each and every week we're able to share with you uh, another one. And we also have a feature on our national television show uh, that's hosted by Jody Marks. That is is our best new product of the week there. Okay, uh, we want to get right back to the Today's Homeowner Hotline. Gail is on the line with us right now from Maine. Gail, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Um, I have a painting question. Okay. Uh, two things. Um, I have mold on uh, on an area where I had removed gutters, so where water had dripped, um, there is, appears to be mold. And also I'm wondering, when's the best time to paint around here? Because we have had some warmer days in the 50s, high 50s, but then it goes down um, in the 30s and 20s at night. And then we have two days of great weather, and then it rains. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that makes it really challenging when you're trying to, you know, plan out that outdoor project. Uh, well, first of all, with, with the mold, um, you know, first thing people want to do is grab some bleach. And bleach is really not the way to – it's just not safe to use. And what we recommend is oxygen bleach, um, and you mix it with water. Uh, might still have to do a little bit of scrubbing there, but a lot of times if you'll um, lightly wet the area where you're working on the mold and then um, – then come back with the mixture and a little bit of a brush. It, it comes off of there pretty well and has a residual effect to keep it away. But also, um, we talk a lot about uh, wet and forget. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It's a fantastic um, mold and mildew um, you know, cleaner, and you might check that out at wetandforget.com, but it's also really, really good for that. But in terms of um, the um, – th- that's a really good question about the temperature and making sure – because you don't want to invest a lot of time in that outdoor paint project to have it go 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 astray. Joe, what do you think on that in terms of some good um, overall guidelines? 
Yeah, Gail, I think you might be starting a little soon. I'm, I'm, I'm in Connecticut, and I'm a couple hundred miles south of you, and it's too early to start here um, because you do want a stretch of decent weather, at least a few days. And um, the maximum and minimum recommended temperature for applying exterior paint depends on whether it's oil-based or latex. I assume you're putting on latex paint. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Well, um, for latex, it's supposed to be between 50 and 85 degrees, which is a pretty broad span. And that's that's general information. You should really, depending on the paint, some paints you can apply in colder uh, in colder temperatures. So read the label on the can. Um, but it should remain the it should remain within that range, you know, for at least. 18 to 24 hours. So if you're painting in 55 degree weather and then two hours later drops to 30, that paint might not have time to bond to the surface, right? So so you have to keep that in mind as well. And of course, you got to check the weather, make sure it's not going to rain immediately after you're applying the paint. But either way, here you are in Maine and it's early May or late April, early May, whenever you decide to try to do this job. I think you're going to have to wait to get a stretch of really decent weather. Okay, well, thank you very much. We didn't get it last year, which is why it didn't, oh. didn't get done. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, the, the warmer weather's got to be coming, even in Maine. Unfortunately, you might have to wait until the end of May or the beginning of June, but um, but I, I think if you wait it out, the house was painted once before, so I'm sure I'm sure you'll find a, a few days that we can get that, <laughs> get that job done. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hey, our pleasure, Gail. Thanks so much for being with us, and you have a great weekend. Because the last thing you want to do, Danny, is apply the paint oh, when no. the surface isn't ready. And then what happens in two weeks? I was like, oh, no. Right. Get, get out the scraper and start all over. And who wants to huh. do that? It is time for that simple solution. And every single week, Joe always provides us a great solution that's extremely simple. What do you have this week, Joe? Well, this one I particularly like because I've used it several times and it works great. I just love this idea. It's when you're cutting a full sheet of plywood on sawhorses, which is pretty typical, but it can be a bit tricky because the sheet has a tendency. It's not fully supported, first of all, because it's just spanning two sawhorses. can be a little dangerous, too. can be dangerous, too. If it sags or binds on the blade, it could kick back the saw. But plus, and the sheet slides around if you're cutting a sheet that's only half inch or quarter inch thick. Um, so here, all you, this is the simple solution. You can support the the sheet, the plywood sheet, by adding a pair of two by four stabilizers to the sawhorse. And the way to do that is you cut two notches in each sawhorse. And the notches just have to be one and a half inches wide and one and a half inch deep inches deep, right? So you cut two notches in each, you span them maybe, depending on the width of your sawhorses, um, maybe two feet or three feet apart, these notches, and you stand a two by four on edge on top of these notches, right? So half of the two by four will go into this notch and it'll stick up a little bit. And then when you lay the sheet on it, and these are eight foot long two by fours, of course, so it'll support the entire sheet. You can cut the sheet. You don't have to worry about sawing into the saw horses, cutting into the saw horses because <laughs> it's elevated. So that's, this, that's the whole simple solution. Notch out the saw horses and just put in these two by fours. That's it. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, and once you do it once, you'll have to do it all along. Because, I mean, reaching out over, you know, you just don't want right. to reach out way over that uh, piece of plywood because that makes it dangerous. You'll end up cutting your cord, cut a couple fingers off. You just uh, <laughs> Don't do it's that. Just, yeah. It's just, yeah. And you can just pop them off. That's the other thing. You just pop them off and store the saw horses the way you normally do. And if you cut up the two by fours with something else, you just have to go buy more two by fours. That's all. And you can see that right now at todayshomeowner.com. There you go. And that's today's homeowner.com slash simple solutions. You can check that one out. That's a video of that and 500 other videos that you can see. Now it's time for our podcast question of the week. This comes from Brad in Iowa. I have a four square house and we've been there for two years. Our home inspector told us to keep the attic screen open for ventilation. Is this right or should I close it? I'm worried about the insulation getting wet. Well, uh, certainly the attic screen. So we would assume, Joe, that that is probably some type of louver, I would hope, that would have screen behind it. Yeah, gable and vent of some sort, right? Right. And uh, without a doubt, um, winter, summer, all the times, we recommend keeping all the ventilation um, open. This this also goes for any crawl spaces you have under your house, is to allow that ventilation to go through there. Extremely important. But when you're talking about the attic space, especially as we're coming into summer, uh, boy, they want to make sure that they keep that open to get some of that air. Hopefully they have the proper soffit 
vents sure. in and around their overhang area right. that will allow it to escape. But they definitely need to keep that open. Yeah, usually people have gable end vents, especially in older homes because there are no ridge vents. And yeah, they should be kept open. And Brad's question is, would the insulation get wet? Well, I mean, un- unless there are no louvers, I mean, I can't imagine why someone would just cut a hole, frame it out, and put a screen over it. Nah, and if no that's way. the case, then yeah, Brad, your insulation is going to get wet and everything else is going to get wet. So <laughs> if that's the case, then tear out the screen, reframe that opening if you have to. You can buy ready-made louvers, that's right. typically made out of cedar, but I think they make uh, vinyl ones now, which are less expensive and last longer. And anyway, and that should have a screen behind it just to keep the bugs out. And the um, and the louvers will keep the rain out. That's right. Exactly. And, you know, it's a good thing if when you get a cool morning to get in your attic with a nice, bright flashlight. Not only is it a good time to check for any possible leaks that you have, but it's also um, to inspect that screen that you will have behind any louvers that you may have in your house because they do get old, they do rust, they do fall apart. And, boy, that is where the squirrels can have a big time in your attic by uh, access in your attic through that. I don't know how they find it. They must have, you know, good eyes. Right. And uh, they find these little areas and then they infiltrate an attic and then you just can't figure out where they're coming from. So uh, that's a good little thing if you want to be a good proactive homeowner to check out that attic screen and make sure it's good and tight. Hey, we appreciate this question and we appreciate all questions that come in and you can send us one at any time at todayshomeowner.com slash Podcast, And we also like to mention in each of our podcasts how much we appreciate the great reviews we get uh, when you're downloading and um, listening to our podcast. We really appreciate that. That allows us to reach even more people with the information that we try to provide each and every week here on Today's Homeowner. So, And also, uh, anytime at all, todayshomeowner.com is a great source for you to get any answers to the questions that you may have. Hey, uh, we really appreciate you being with us. I'm Danny Lippard, along with Joe Truini. We'll talk with you soon.